And if you've got a Bible, you could have a look at uh, Luke chapter 2. Otherwise, you can just listen if you like. Let's pray first. Our Father, we ask that as we read again and listen again to this uh, famous story that we know so well, that you might speak to us in our minds and hearts, that you might uh, help us understand it a bit better, that you might do something in our own minds and hearts to draw us closer to you, to answer our questions, to turn our hearts to you this morning. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I learned something the other day. Actually, I'm always learning things. That's one of the things about growing older. You keep learning things. And uh, some of you, this is a sort of a cultural thing for people of a certain age. Remember the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where they uh, uh, got this computer to work out what the meaning of life was. And the answer was 42. And uh, I remember this every time someone I know turns 42. But it's not anything to do with age. I worked out what it was about. Actually, I read about it. I was told about it. Uh, because in the ASCII computing language, 42 is the code number for the asterisk. And the asterisk in various maths and science things is the, th is the symbol you put in when, you, when it can mean anything you like. So the cynical answer of the computer in the, Gal in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was the meaning of life is whatever you want it to be. Which for some of us, that's a really good thing. But it's only a temporarily good thing because after a while you find out that uh, you can't really find out what the meaning of life is. What's it really about? What, why am I here? What, what is the purpose of it? And the older we get, the more we think about, well, maybe it was this, maybe that was a thing, but that didn't really work. Now what about this? What about that? And Well, it can get quite confusing, really. Christmas, however, gives us a time and a basis for working out what life's really about. Now, let's have a look at this picture, Andrew. Now, is there anything true about this picture? This is another little cultural reference. Uh, some of you will recognize the DeLorean, uh, the time machine car from Back to the Future. Is it possible that you could have gone back into the future, back into the past, and crashed into the stable? Well, you couldn't have known. But is there anything, actually, anything in this picture that's true? And the answer is no. There's almost nothing in it that's true. A uh, stable isn't true. It's a very modern stable with uh, machine-cut uh, timbers and all sorts of things like that. But, uh, okay, that's enough of that. I think that's a pretty terrible picture. Go on to the next one. Thanks, Andrew. Go to the black screen. If you were able to go back with your iPhone or your camera, if you actually could go back to the time of the birth of Jesus, would you have been able to take pictures of what Luke describes here? if you could go back. Could you have taken pictures of what Luke describes here? Now come on, you should know the answer to this. The answer is yes. You could have put it on YouTube. <laughs> Just as well it happened then and not now. Eh? But you see, what Luke is writing is stuff he's researched and he's writing it down because it really happened. It's really actually true what he wrote. Now actually, what we celebrate and think about at Christmas and all the pictures and stuff is actually not exactly what Luke wrote. It's been added to. There's a whole lot of accumulated embellishments added to this story. But the story that Luke wrote, the story that what actually happened, is actually very significant for human beings. It actually helps human beings work out who they are and why they're here and what they ought to be about. Well, what did actually happen? Some say this is a fairly far-fetched story. But actually you think, if it's really true, if it's really true that God really became a human, what would you expect to happen? Now, at one level, well, yeah, this is, all this would make sense of that. On the other hand, as I might try and suggest to you in a moment, you, would, you might expect a lot more than what actually happened. Well, what did happen? So there's Joseph and Mary. Uh, jo Mary's been, they've both been told about this baby. They're travelling from Nazareth, 170 k's more or less, down to Bethlehem. They get there in plenty of time, because you know back in those days, everybody knew how long it take to produce a baby. It was still nine months then, and they all knew that. And, so, and they were clever people, because he was a carpenter. So they got there in time. They didn't rush in in the middle of the night, and she wasn't in labour when she arrived in Bethlehem. They'd been there for some time. And then the baby came. And it was born in a crowded house. It wasn't born in an inn and it wasn't born in a stable. 
uh, the word that's used in the translation I read is a guest room. There was a, it was probably a, a simple two-roomed house like you see all around the world these days, uh, a guest room which was full because there were lots of visitors there, family and others, and there was a common sort of room and, and below it, uh, where, the, where the floor ended and before the, you got to the wall was a lower piece where some of the animals were kept at night, there'd be a feeding trough there, so they'd clear the animals out, put the baby there so no one treads on it, uh, a crowded thing. So it's a very low class, ordinary common or garden experience, crowded, and you, have to, you have to go to a crowded country to understand this I think. Lots of people, all the visitors, all the rallies, you see in that, in that culture and in most cultures outside the Western world nowadays, if you're a pregnant woman with your husband for your first baby and you're travelling 170 k's to a place which is your family home area and all your relatives are there, are they not going to accommodate you? Of course, there's no way that they're not going to accommodate them. So anyway, she's, in, she's away from home but amongst relatives, crowded, and then we've got the shepherds. So the shepherds are out there minding their business and their sheep and this angel comes and terrifies them and the angel says, well today the promises have come true. There's a saviour, the Messiah, been born in Bethlehem just down the road, go and have a look. And then there's this huge chorus of angels saying, glory to God, peace on earth. And so off they go to Bethlehem, find the baby, see Mary, Joseph, the baby, wrapped in cloths in the manger, then they come back. On the way they tell everybody they see about how, how it is. Everyone's amazed and astonished. They go back to the sheep and that's it. No other announcement. Is this, uh, this, is, this is a PR failure, wouldn't you say? If the Son of God is really being born, this is not happening in Jerusalem. It's not where the king is. It's not where the leaders are. There's not an eight-day festival with, with all sorts of bunting like we've got around our city now. Uh, lights and coloured stuff and trumpets and shows and celebrating the birth of the new king. This is, this is out in the bush. Uh, the angels are told out in the paddock in the middle of the night. They were terrified. That was a pretty good show with all the angels. But that's all there is. I mean, the wise men came later. They got the address wrong and they told the story to the the king by mistake, that wasn't an announcement. So what is God doing here? Like what's God getting out of this? Uh, and, and not only that, but the baby's born there for 30 years, there's nothing. There's silence for 30 years. Um, do you see this is very strange? It, without all the embellishments, this is a very simple low-grade story that's not being told to very many people at all. And possibly it tells us we're making too much of Christmas. Maybe it's just a big anticlimax. Like, is that all there is? That's all Luke tells us. And we've embellished it. And you can see that's one of the reasons we've embellished it. All sorts of myths and legends and other pretty things all added to it because the simple story kind of doesn't seem right. Why is that? Why did God do it like that? It's a, it's a mystery, isn't it? And uh, I haven't got time to tell you the whole reason why he doesn't do it tonight, cause, today because that's a bit of a sidetrack. But one of the reasons that God has done it like this is to confound the human idea that this should be made into a really important thing. These are low social status people. They're out away from the centre of everything. They've got no power or significance or anything. And God is doing something, as it were, on the quiet because he's not impressed by the way... Emperor Caesar Augustus, for example, might celebrate his birthday because that will be done with a big show. But what is the big deal then? Is this just a quaint, exotic story? Now, I don't think there was a stable, so that removes the exotic. Is it just a quaint story? God undermining our ideas of what's important. But there's something hidden here. And the thing that's hidden cannot be explained too quickly. It takes time to unfold and we're told in the story that we heard, read, that Mary pondered these things in her heart. This is the mother. She ponders and thinks, why is that? Because there's something deep here. This is not just about some amazing angel show and shepherds with poo on their boots. What does it mean? What's this about? And why should we take it seriously? Now in these first couple of chapters of Luke, Luke has put together about a dozen little stories, 
all of which contribute a little bit to help us understand who this person is. And apart from the drama of the various angels that we've just read about, the human stories are low-key, they're ordinary, they're mundane. These are working-class people. Um, they are, Mary and Joseph are theologically important, but socially unimportant. Because the attention is not on the human action, and the attention is not even on the circumstances and the events. It's a kind of a puzzle. God has presented us with a puzzle at Christmas. Angels and the manger are a paradox. Why are these two things together? A little feeding trough and enormous company of angels. Those two things kind of don't fit. And God, I think, has intentionally confounded us with this paradox to work out what that's about. The focus, you see, is not on the events or the circumstances of the birth, but on the interpretation of it. What does it mean? Who is this child? And how is this baby different from all the other little boys who were murdered on the orders of King Herod all around Bethlehem? All of those, how is this one different? And for that matter, how is this baby different to you when you were a baby? And how is this baby different to your babies? Everyone had the best baby, didn't they? And then they had another one, and then there was a bit of competition to see which was the really best one. How is this baby different? Well, we've got to find out from what Luke says. And what Luke has told us in these first few chapters is this one is the son of the Most High, David's promised successor, going to be the king forever. He's the son of God, he's the Messiah, the Saviour, he's the Lord. Now that's a huge host of huge titles, aren't they? If you were honoured with all of that, you'd have medals and crowns and big robes and everything, wouldn't you? That'd be that's a really important list of jobs or titles or distinctions, this little child. Or to say it another way, watch this child. This is a child you should keep an eye on because at the moment it just looks like another baby. All babies look the same, don't they? Well, the mothers don't think that, but everyone else can see they're all look much the same. But what's the difference with this one? Well, keep an eye on this one. See what happens as this child grows up. And as you do, 30 years later, mind you, when you start to see what... What do you see? What do you see this child when he's, when he's grown? You see the living God in a human body. You see a real human, a child of Mary, displaying the power of God. You see the child of Mary growing up into an adult male human exercising the power of God, speaking the words of God, showing the love and compassion of God to all kinds of people. And then he's killed, judicially murdered, taken to death. The body that he created in the womb of Mary is killed and put in the grave. But he says it's for everyone. He says it's for the forgiveness of sins. He says it's to abolish death because he doesn't stay dead very long. He's really dead. Raised from the dead. And this body that he formed in the womb of Mary, dead but now recreated, brought to life, raised as a body that will never ever be in danger of death again. Raised from death so that humans who fear death and are worried about not only how they'll die, but what happens after it. And many, of course, have got that thing in their mind saying, well, nothing will happen after it. But you don't know that, do you? And in fact, the evidence of the Scriptures is against it, because Jesus has been raised from the dead so that every human being like him, all the other human beings with bodies like his, one day could be raised with bodies that will never die. Share the presence of God and the character and the life of God. And he takes this transformed, risen body that he formed in the first place in the womb of Mary and he takes it to the right hand of his father where he rules over everything that there is and he makes a promise that he's the one who will bring back to life and live with him forever all those who put their life in his hands. Here is a key to the meaning of our life. The meaning of our life has to do with knowing the one who's not only created us but who can recreate us into a life and a, with a body that will last for eternity. The one who's dealt with our chief and unconquerable problem, that is death. He is the one who has abolished death. He is the one who says, 
those who belong to me and who trust their lives to me, they can be sure that they will pass through death to life with me forever. Death will not be the end, but what God intended all the time will be the case, that you will live in the presence of God with the life of God in you. The baby gives the clue. And that's what you see if you watch this child. What should you do if you watched the child and seen what the child said and did and what happened to him and what he did? Well, you've got to believe it or not believe it. Luke's written it down really clearly and simply so you can believe it. It's believable, certainly true record of what happened. The interpretation though, is this really the one who's come as the creator, the recreator, the raiser of the dead, the one who gives new life? If he is, you ought to put your life in his hands. You ought to submit yourself to him and ask him for his life so that you've got a dynamic, powerful relationship with the living and creating God. That would be a wonderful thing to do if it was true. And if it's true, why would you not do that? Oh, well, one of the reasons people don't want to do it is because there's a conflict still as to who's really God, me or him. That's a human problem all along, isn't it? That's why he brought us to death, so we could start again and give us a life where we, we'd given up that struggle. They think that we were the ones who told God what to do. But here is a wonderful, deep relationship with the living God that is possible for anyone who puts their lives in the hands of this great God. And we, like the shepherds, ought to be people who praise him, make known what he's done. There's much more here than a quaint, exotic story. And the low-key, strange, paradoxical events direct us to who he is. Forget all the embellishments and the myths and the legends added to it. Strip all that away if you can. And just see that God has done something really simple and really out of the ordinary to ordinary people so that we can set aside our own ideas of what's really great and important and listen to what the angels have said and others have said about who this child is. This is the creator, the recreator, the one who destroys death and forgives sins and recreates humans the way they were meant to be. And like the little ditty that we sang earlier, he's the one who saves. He saves you to be the human that God intended you to be. And he saves you to be in a deep and powerful relationship with the living God. And he will save you through death to life with him forever. The meaning of life is not an asterisk. It's not whatever you want it to be because God himself has made it clear what it's about. It's about being like Jesus, who is God himself, and who's come and taken a human body from Mary's womb, so that we can see not only what it's like, but we can share the same life with him for those who trust ourselves to him. Trust him today. Put your life in his hands. Give up the struggle. Give up the confusion, and let this be the clue to finding what your life is really meant to be about and enter into a dynamic relationship with this living creating God. Let's pray.